Hello, I'm Pastor Timothy James Farrell, and I serve as the founding and lead pastor of a non-denominational church here in Bloomington Normal called The Tab. And I would like to invite you to join us for worship some Sunday morning at 10 a.m. The Tab is located at 1845 West Hovey Avenue in Normal, Illinois. I also want to invite you to visit our ministry website at thetab.tv. There's lots of wonderful resources and ministry there for you to take advantage of. Thank you for being with us today on this Tab Telecast. Here is this week's message. Good morning. There we go. Hallelujah. He is alive. Amen. And that changes everything. We are so glad that you are here. We want to welcome you to our Easter Resurrection Sunday morning celebration service. Amen. Would you put your hands together one more time for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We are so glad you're here today. And uh, we want to welcome all of you that are watching us live right now via our tab telecast on Facebook. Thank you for joining us today from uh, wherever you might be watching us. We've got people from all over America. Uh, and we're believing very soon around the world. Amen. We'll be, uh, we'll be joining us uh, via our media ministries. We're so glad you're here. Watching us also on YouTube. Thank you for joining us on our YouTube channel. We're so glad you're here. We want to welcome you also to our worship celebration service today. And we also at this time want to dismiss the kids to go to Tab Kids. Yes. All right, kiddos. I thought I'd get more of a hand clap from a parent or something. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Oh, isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, praise team, for that wonderful praise and worship service. Amen, amen, amen. It's just good to knock the, I don't know, the worries off you, right? and get in His presence. And uh, you know, the Bible says that in God's presence is fullness of joy. Isn't that something? Everything you're looking for, everything you need is found in one place, and that is in the presence of God. Never forget that. He is all that in a bag of chips. <laughs> all right? He is all that in a bag of chips. He's everything. Everything, everything, everything. Well, hey, we are so glad you're here, and uh, we do want to welcome you to this worship service. You know, when... Um, when you think about the reason for today's celebration, uh, what do you think of when you think of Easter? Most people in the world, unfortunately, think Easter is about a bunny and about some candy and some eggs. And, and again, I, I've never had a Cadbury egg I did not like. <laughs> You know, or jelly beans. I mean, if you like some jelly beans, right? Uh, and uh, you know, but that's not what that's not what Easter's about. Amen. Uh, it's not about the uh, the pink grass or or the uh, the fluffy bunny or as good as those Cadbury eggs are. It is about Jesus Christ and specifically His love demonstrated for you and for me for our world some two thousand years ago. And uh, I've got some things I just want to share with you today from my heart. And uh, I believe uh, this message uh, for all of us. Uh, don't want to single anybody out for all of us uh, is a probably one of the most important messages I think I could ever preach, ever give, and you could ever hear. So I'm glad you're here today. Uh, just have some things on my heart. Real quick, I want to share with you. And the first one is this, the most important. If you got your tab uh, message outline notes ready, here's the most important thing uh, I could share with you right out of the bat, and that is this. God loves you. God loves you. And uh, it's because of his love for you uh, that what happened some 2,000 years ago happened. Amen. Um, so God loves you today. Jeremiah 31 verse 3 says these words, I have loved you, God says, with an everlasting love. Oh, that's so good. I have loved you, please hear that, with an everlasting love. Now, some of you might be saying, well, Pastor Tim, that's all fine and dandy, but you don't know what I've done, and uh, you don't know where I've been, and you don't know what I've said. Well, you're right. I probably don't know, but God does. 
And here's the wonderful thing. In spite of all you and I have done, in spite of all we've said, in spite of some of the, the places we shouldn't have been, God loves you with an everlasting love. You cannot outrun the love of God for you. Amen? My children can't outrun my love. They might disappoint me. They might say some things that I'm not too happy about. They might do some things I don't like. But that doesn't stop my love for them. They're usually sitting here. That's why I'm pointing at them. Uh, but they're out serving today. Uh, but that's the love of God for you and for me. And it was, isn't just one thing for us to hear it. You know, God says, I've loved you with an everlasting love, but God demonstrated it. I love that. He, God shows us His love. John 3.16, the most probably quoted and memorized verse in the Bible says this, God so loved the world, you, me, and everybody in the world that He did what? He demonstrated it 2,000 years ago by giving his one and only son. How many of you give gifts to those you love? Amen. Hallelujah. It's an expression, right, of our hearts. We love to give to people we love in our lives. And it's natural. It's not something that, you know, somebody's twisting your arm to do. No, we love to give. We love to bless. We love to, to you know, please those that we love. God so loved you that He gave His one and only Son. John 8, 42, just talking about the love of God here this morning. says Jesus says this, I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Isn't that amazing? See, God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. God gave the world the gift, the gift of His Son. And He was sent here on a mission by God the Father. 1 John 4, 9 says this, This is how God showed or demonstrated, expressed, not just verbalized, that's important, we need to say to one another, and we need to hear it, do we not, from those that, that are in our lives. The three, I believe, one of the most powerful words that have ever been spoken over lips of clay, and that is these words, I love you. We all need to hear that. Um, and we need to do probably a better job of saying that. But if all we're doing is saying it and not demonstrating it, 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 it falls short. So God says, I love you, but then God did what? God demonstrated it. God showed us. Uh, he wasn't just giving us some lip service. This is how God showed us His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might what? That we might live through Him. That we might live through Him. I'm going to come back to that thought here in just a little bit. The first thing I want to share with you today, the most important message, and someone needs to hear this, probably you, certainly me, that God loves you today. Don't ever doubt the love of God. See, that's the enemy. And he does a pretty good job of that. The enemy will whisper in our world, our, our, in our world and in our ears, you know, we blow it, and immediately the voice of condemnation comes in and says, Oop, you're done. It's over for you. God doesn't love you anymore. God could never love someone like you. Come on now, we've all heard those words. We all have from time to time. Well, the devil's a liar. <laughs> Jesus said he's the father of lies. Matter of fact, just spit it on the old devil every time he goes to talking to you. And uh, when he's telling you one thing, you're just flipping on him because he can't tell the truth. So if the devil tells you God hates you, well, then you just turn and say, devil, you're a liar. And just, just because you tell me God hates me, the opposite is true. God loves me. I'm loved with an everlasting love. I can't say anything so bad. I can't do anything so, so horrible, so horrific that would stop and cease the love of God coming into my heart and life. Hallelujah. God loves you. The second thing I want to share with you today is God created you to experience His love. Boy, isn't this amazing? Out of all the things God created in the world, made in the world, Mankind, humankind, is the only thing created and made by God 
to experience his love. Genesis 1 verse 27. Let's go all the way back. Can we go back today to the Garden of Eden? says this, God created mankind in His image. In the image of God, He created them, male and female. God created them. Now, real quick study on the creation account. God created things in like kind to have a relationship with their kind. Do you ever recognize cows hang out with cows? <laughs> Camels hang out with camels. Pigs, we got some pig farmers. Pigs hang out with pigs, right? God created you and I in His image. Why? To experience His love. To experience the relationship with Him. In other words, God wants us, can I say it like I want to say it? To hang out with Him. Hallelujah. That's what heaven's going to be about. It's going to be about just us hanging with God. I love, boy, I tell you what, go back to, the, the, everybody wants to know what the perfect will of God is. You can read it real quick in about 15 minutes. Genesis 1 and 2, Revelation 21, 22. The first two chapters, last two chapters of the Bible. There's your homework assignment today. You want to know what the perfect will of God is, that's it. And you will find, and you will see, and you will read where God and mankind were doing life with one another. And it was wonderful. In other words, Adam and Eve walked the beach with God. They had a bonfire with God. They talked with God face to face like you and I are talking, to, talking with one another. That's what God, God created you for. You're not a mistake. I don't care what the world says. God created you. God made you. What? To experience His Love. The psalmist said, Psalm 100, verse 3, The Lord is God, and it is He who made us. God made us. God created us. Psalm 139, 13 through 14, says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am what? I am fearfully and wonderfully made. In other words, God just didn't haphazard put us together. No, God intentionally created, manufactured, formed, fashioned us for what? For a relationship with Him. You and I are fearfully and wonderfully made. God doesn't make any mistakes. In other words, does that make sense? You are not a mistake. I don't care how God had to get you into this earth. Somebody needs to hear today out in TV land, you're not a mistake. And you certainly didn't evolve from an ape. That's a lie. Let's just tell it what it is. God created you. God formed you. God fashioned you to experience His love, to experience a life-giving relationship with Him for all eternity. Hallelujah. The next thing I want to share with you today is this. God has a plan for your life. God has a purpose for your life. Jeremiah 29 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, the God that made you, the God that loves you, says, I've got a plan for you. And here's what the plan is. Plans to what? Prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and to give you a future. In other words, God is a good God and God's got a good plan, a perfect plan for your life. God, in fact, I would say has an awesome plan for your life. No one can do you like Jesus. I don't care what your dream is about your life. I don't care what your plan is for your life. I guarantee you one thing, my brother and sister, God has a greater plan. God has a greater plan. I, pr I pray all that all the time. God, I just want to live out your plan for my life. Because I know God's plan, I can, and I've got a pretty creative mind. I can come up with some good stuff for Pastor Tim. <laughs> right? And that falls short of, the, of my creator's plans for me. Amen? So we need to be praying like that prayer uh, Jesus taught us to pray in Luke 11. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Lord, I want your plan to happen in my life. 
Lord, you've got a great plan. And boy, it's, boy, doesn't that sound like a plan to prosper us, not to harm us, to give us hope, to give us a future. Lord, let your plan come to pass in my life. The Apostle John, 3 John verse 2 says, Beloved, those people that are beloved. That's a compound word, by the way. I did graduate from English class. <laughs> beloved. You are beloved. Beloved. Those loved by God. I wish, the King James says, I desire above all things that you what? That you may be miserable in life. <laughs> that you may struggle in life. That you may be impoverished and perilous in life. No. Beloved, here's God's will for your life. I desire, I wish, oh, I wish above all things, my children, that you, uh, that you prosper and that you're in health even as your soul prospers. Boy, any good parent, that's your wish, isn't it, for your children, children, your grandchildren? Oh, I just, I want my children to be, be blessed, more blessed than me. I do. I want them to prosper more than I prosper. I want them to be, excuse me, <coughs> healthy and whole. Come on now. And that's God's will for what? For us, His children. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. God loves you with an everlasting love. Jesus said again, as one of my missions, I come to earth, John 10, 10. I have come that you what? That you may have life and have it more abundantly. Well, you might be asking today, Pastor Tim, if God loves me, if God created me, if God has a wonderful plan and purpose for my life, then what's wrong? Why don't I feel God's love? Why am I not experiencing the abundant life Jesus came to give me? Right? There's a disconnect. The reason you and I, people, humanity, aren't living and experiencing the love of God, living the abundant, blessed, victorious life that God wants and desires all of us to live, regardless of age or race, is because of what the Bible calls sin. Sin. Now, what is sin? Write this down if you're taking notes. Sin is rebellion and disobedience to God's Word, will, and ways. The problem with humanity is sin. According to the Word of God, according to the, the Word of God, the Bible, that tells us God loves us with an everlasting love, that we've been created and made to experience and encounter that love. The Bible, the same Bible that tells us God's got a perfect plan to prosper and bless the socks off you, is the same Bible that tells us what the problem is. It's sin. Let's go back to the garden. Genesis 1 and 2. There's Adam and Eve sitting around the bonfire. Right? Uh, making s'mores. <laughs> Everything was going great. They were living, literally out. They were living out the, will, the perfect will of God in their lives. And then one thing happened, and it changed everything. What happened? Sin. Adam and Eve sinned against God. Now, they only had one thing they were told not to do. God said, you see all the trillion trees I made and created in this world, Adam and Eve? They said, yeah, God, you're pretty good. Boy, that's something else. He says, you can have all the trees in the world, but you see that tree over there? I think, you know, he made them really look. Stop right now. I'm, I'm you see that tree, Adam? And they're like, yeah, we see it, God. He says, okay, now that tree right there, you can look at. Uh, you can climb. You can put a swing in the branches of that tree. But the fruit from that tree you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall what? You shall die. That was the only commandment they were given. The world was their sandbox. The world was their playpen. Now, guess what those jokers did? 
They did the one thing God told them not to do. They only had one thing. God said, don't do it. And what did they do? He went for a walk, and Adam and Eve got a little too close, and they started what? Eating the fruit off that tree. And they what? They sinned. They rebelled. They disobeyed God's word. Don't eat from the tree. God's will and God's ways for them. Sin entered the world and with it a whole lot of stuff. Let's just talk real quick. Can we not this morning about the effects of sin? We see the effects of sin all around us. But let's just look real quick at some effects that not just Adam and Eve's sin, but your sin and my sin and the sins of humanity bring to our world. Here it is. Number one, the first effect of sin is this. Sin separates us from God. What did Adam and Eve's sin do? It separated them from God. They went from having and experiencing a life-giving relationship with one another to being separated. The prophet Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, Your iniquities have what? Separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden His face from you. See, that's the problem. The problem is sin. And one of the effects of sin is it separates us. Watch this now. Please listen. Pay attention. Come back. It separates us from experiencing the love of God. It separates us from experiencing God's perfect plan and purpose for our lives. It's serious. It's deadly serious, in fact. Romans 3, verse 10, the great apostle Paul talking about sin says this, There's no one righteous, not even one. None of us. Romans 3, 23, 13 verses later, the apostle Paul says all. Someone say all. all. And you know what the word all means in the original Greek language? All. It means all. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was deeper than that. All means all. All of us have sinned. What is sin? Rebellion and disobedience to God. I don't care what it is. The one thing you and I all have in common this morning is this. We're all sinners. Now, we might have sinned differently, and we might have sinned more or less than the person sitting next to you. Now, don't look at anybody. <laughs> But let's just be honest with one another. Let's certainly be honest before God. We've all sinned. <laughs> We've all sinned. There's no one righteous. There's no one that's got it all right. And it's our sins. It's your sin. It's my sin that separates us from experiencing God. It gets worse. What's another effect of sin? Look at this. Sin brought death disease and depravity to us. Romans 5, 12. Just as sin entered the world through one man, remember Adam and Eve? And death through sin. And in this way, watch this now, death came to all people because all sinned. So the soul that sins shall die. That was what God warned them about, right? Back in the Garden of Eden. You can don't eat that fruit. I'm telling you, you eat it, you're gonna die. We're all, we're all recipients of death. Sin, wages of sin, Romans 6:23. The wages of sin is death. The more you and I rebel against God, the more you and I disobey God, His Word, His will, and His ways for our lives, the greater the effects of sin happen. You, you find somebody that majors in sin, and some of you majored in sin. I mean, you got a doctorate in it. <laughs> and I can guarantee you, you suffered more than the person that just, you know, graduated from kindergarten. Now, so, so the, the effects of sin vary in regards to our rebellion and disobedience. But regardless, we've all sinned. We've all sinned and we're all going to reap, unfortunately, the destructive 
punishment of our sins. You know what's wrong with the world today? Everybody's wondering, how are we going to fix the world? Yeah. How are we going to, how, the, there's so many problems in the world today, we can't name them all. Yeah. Well, the, the, the truth of the matter is this, the root is the same. The root problem with the world today is summed up in one word, sin. See, here, let, me, let me break it down for you. Some of you are kind of looking at me like, let's go deeper in that, Pastor Tim. Mm -hmm. Because that's not what CNN, and that's not what MSNBC is telling me, and that's not what Fox is telling me, and that's not what Grandma's telling me. We don't have a race problem, people. We've got a sin problem. We don't have a prejudice problem. We have a sin problem. We don't have a hate problem. We have a sin problem. We don't have a sickness problem. We have a sin problem. We don't have a death problem. We have a sin problem. The root, and you know, the tree, every tree has roots. The root is underground. You can't see it. But you can see the trunk and you can see the fruit. All the, what we'd like to talk about is the fruit. See, this problem and that problem and this problem, we can, you can pluck the tree of sin all you want, but if you don't deal with the root, the fruit is going to grow back. And that's what we're seeing. See, it's not, it's all the effects aren't the problem. The effects are the effects of the problem. The problem is what? The root of sin. So if we deal with the root, if you change the root, you change what? The fruit. Boy, that's good. Someone write that down. That right there ought to be in Pastor Tim's notes. <laughs> write that down for me so I can put it in my book. If you, if you fix the root, you fix the fruit. That's why Paul goes into the sin nature. See, when we're born again, we, we are, our roots changed. Our root from the sin nature is uprooted, and God puts in us what? A spirit nature, the nature of God within us. And we're what? We're born again. I, this is deep. I didn't intend to go that deep this morning, but it is what it is. The Holy Spirit wants us to go there. So the question is there, boy, that's pretty dark right there. Sin separates us from God. Sin is the one that brought death and, and disease and depravity, depression, <laughs> and all the, all the bad stuff that's going on in the world today. The lying, the cheating, the backstabbing, and the betraying are all apples on the tree of sin. Okay? That's why I get up here from time to time and I just remind us that Jesus is the answer for the world today. He is. He's not just another answer along with the government's, you know, policies. No, 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 no. Jesus is the answer. He's the only answer for the world today because he's the only one that dealt with sin. Hallelujah. Uh, we've got a giant. We got a giant that we've been facing in our lives, and it's called the giant of death. And here's the wonderful thing there is hope. There is hope for humanity to be ransomed, redeemed, restored, and reconciled to God. That's what today is all about. Please listen to this. That's what Easter Resurrection Sunday morning is about every year. It's reminding us, like we just sang about, that we have a living hope in Jesus Christ that despite the problems, despite the chaos, despite the lying and the cheating and the backstabbing and the betraying, there's hope. There's hope. There's hope in Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus Christ wants and I love this. Oh, what a Savior we serve. Once and for all, defeated sin and conquered death. Make no mistake about it. Jesus defeated the giant of death. Let's see, he defeated it in two ways. Let's go real quick into this. Write this down so that you never forget it. Jesus defeated the giant of death for you and for me and for everyone by dying for our sins. See, someone's going to die. 
for your sins. It's either you or someone that loves you. Romans 3.23 says, the wages of sin is death. The payoff or penalty for sin is you're going to die physically, but spiritually. But here's the good news. But. Someone say but. but. Someone say but. but. <laughs> the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God. This is so good. This is the gospel. The gift of God is eternal life. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that good? See, you had to work for sin. You had to work hard to die. That's what a wage means, right? How many of you got a J-O-B? Yeah, you go, to, you go to work 40, 50, 60 hours a week. At the end of that week, they're going to give you some money. They're going to give you a wage for your work. Watch this now. As a payment. The more we sin, the more we earn payment. But the payoff is death, depression, depravity, disease, darkness. Boy, I don't like that payment, Pastor Tim. No, I don't either. The wages of sin is death. But the gift, boy, I love gifts. How many of you like gifts? See, a gift is something you don't work for. A gift is something that someone else worked for that is free to you. See, you had to work to die. But you only have to receive the gift of eternal life to live. And that gift has a name. His name is Jesus. Someone say Jesus. Jesus. Romans 5 verse 8. I am preaching good this Easter Sunday morning. Hallelujah. God demonstrated His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners... Christ died for us. See, God doesn't wait for you and I to get right with God before we what? Get right with God. See, while we're still blowing it, while we're still running in rebellion, while we're still disobedient, God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, in the world to save us from our sins. How did He do that? Why did He do that? Because of love. Love will do some wonderful, amazing things. Amen. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ suffered once for the sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. There it is. There's reconciliation. To bring you to God. He is, here it is, put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. See, Jesus died for you because the payoff or the wage of your sin and my sin is death. 1 John 3, 16 says, this is how we know what love is. How do we know what love is? Here it is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Boy, no, demonst no greater demonstration can one person give or show another than to die for that person. Boy, if someone dies for you, it doesn't get any better than that. They can't do anything more to show you, to demonstrate to you, to express to you their love for you than to die for you. Jesus died for you out of his love for you. Wow. What a Savior. What a God. 1 John 4, 8 through 10. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might what? Live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus defeated 2,000 years ago, please listen to this, the giant of death by dying for you and for me on Calvary's cross. Why? For our sins. For our sins. Secondly, write this down. Jesus defeated the giant of death here it is, by rising from the dead. He first defeated the giant of death by dying, taking your sins upon him, and dying the penalty that was yours and it was mine to bear. But secondly, Jesus defeated the giant of death ultimately by rising from the dead. Matthew 28, 1 through 7 tells us what happened on this morning some 2,000 years ago. It says, after the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, the first day of the week is Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. 
the tomb where Jesus was buried. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone, and sat on it. Whew, I can't wait to see this up in heaven on the DVD. <laughs> <laughs> oh, his appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards, remember the Roman guards, were so afraid of him, they shook these mighty strong men, shook and became like dead men, just over one little angel, little private P.F. Chang angel. <laughs> they became like dead men. The angel said to the women, I love this, here's all these big tough guys, you know, shaking in their boots, <laughs> falling over like dead men, and, and here's the women just standing there. And I'll tell you, women, you, you got to watch out for them. They're tough. <laughs> you, uh, yeah, just try, you, <laughs> just try crossing one, man, see how tough they are. <laughs> Can I get an amen from a woman today? Hallelujah. Don't mess with them. I'm telling you, they're bad. The woman standing there, the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know you're looking for Jesus, he who was crucified. Here it is. He is not here. The three words that change eternity and time for all ages. He has risen. Woo! That's it. He is risen. Just as he said, Come and see the place where he lay, and then go quickly and tell the disciples he is risen from the dead and is a going ahead of you into Galilee. And I love this. There you will see him. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. People don't see dead people. People see alive people. He's alive forevermore. Risen victorious over sin, death, hell, and the grave. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 5, the Apostle Paul says this, What I received, I passed on to you as utmost importance. In other words, Paul's saying, listen, listen, listen. This is really important. Take out your iPad and write this down. That Christ died. For what? For our sins. Why? Because the problem with humanity is sin. I love it. Jesus died for sins because he knew that was the problem. You fix the problem, you provide the solution. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and that he was raised, what? On the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. Hallelujah. Jesus defeated the giant of death 2,000 years ago by going to the cross, by dying for your sins and my sins and all the sins of humanity, past, present, and future. You mean to tell me, Pastor Tim, that Jesus died for the sins I've yet to commit? Absolutely. Every single one of them, sister. Jesus died 2,000 years ago. All your sins were in the future. You weren't even born yet. And Jesus died for it all. His blood covers it all. Covered it all. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a God we serve. And then Jesus on the third day was resurrected from the grave. Watch this now. Victorious over sin, hell, and the grave. Okay. So what must we do? What must we do? to appropriate and receive God's love. What must we do to appropriate and receive God's salvation? What must we do this morning right here in this place or in your little living room to receive the victory over our sin and the wages thereof, which are death? What must we do? There's three things we got to do. Number one, write this down. I'm giving you the solution. We must believe Jesus is Lord and Savior. Acts 16, 31 says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will what? You will be saved. The King James says, you shall be saved. In the Greek, it actually says this, you shall most certainly be saved. That's what you must do to appropriate God's love, God's salvation, and God's victory. 
Acts 13, 38 through 39. Luke says, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who, say it with me, believes is justified from everything they could not be justified or saved from by following the law. See, it's through belief in what Jesus Christ did for you and for me on Calvary's cross some 2,000 years ago that saves us from our sins. John 3, 17 and 18. We all know John 3, 16. Most of you do anyway. But look at verse 17 and 18. It says this, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Why did God send Jesus? To save us from our sins. To defeat the giant of death. For whoever, say it with me, believes in Him is not condemned. Condemnation's a bad thing, right? It's, it's actually a judicial term. You know, when you go to court and the judge condemns a person, boy, that's a bad thing. Boom. But there's no condemnation for those who what? For those who believe in Jesus. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. See, we have a death sentence over us from the moment we're born. We're born, the Bible says, in iniquity. We're born with a sin nature. In other words, there's a reason cows moo. There's a reason pigs oink. There's a reason lambs bow. Because it's their nature. It's in the nature of the thing. They can't, they can't help it. See, you and I, isn't it interesting? It's easier to sin than not to sin. Until you become saved. And you have a nature reversal. And it becomes harder to sin than not to sin. Now, do we still sin from occasionally from time to time as Christians? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's where 1 John 1, 8 and 9 come in. If you sin, or when you sin, what do you do? You confess it. You say, oh, man, I, right? In other words, I'm not a sinner who does some righteous things. I'm a righteous person who occasionally does some unrighteous things. And we what? We confess that to God. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. Whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Because they've not what? They've not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. John 3, 36 says this, whoever believes in the Son has what? Has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life. Why? For God's wrath remains on them. Someone say believe. We've got to believe. Number one. Number two, we must receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We first must believe in Him. That He is Lord, that He is Savior, that He did die for our sins, that He is resurrected and alive forevermore. We first must believe that. But then we've got to receive that. We have to receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, our personal Lord and Savior. John 1, 12 says to all, someone say all, and all means all, to all who received Him. To those who, what, believed in His name. The name Jesus, in case you didn't know, means literally Savior. The name Jesus literally means Savior. To those who believed in His name, He, God, gave them the right. Well, I have the right. Yes, you do. You have the right to become, watch this now, children of God, born again of God. Well, how do I do that? Here it is. The salvation equation. Believe plus receive equals become. You didn't know you were going to do math today <laughs> when you came to church. When we believe, when we receive Jesus, we what? We become children of God, forgiven of all of our sins, transgressions, and inequities. But we have to believe it, and we have to what? We have to receive it. 
It was kind of like going to the grocery store. You got your little cart with you, you know. You go into the grocery store and you get a whole bunch of food, you know, and you put it in your cart and you get some water and you get some drinks and you put it in your cart because you're hungry, right? You fill that cart full. Some of you, like Mama Pharaoh, overflowing, <laughs> right? And you could put that cart in the middle of that grocery store surrounded by food. And you can say this all you want. I believe that this food will sustain me physically. I believe if I eat this food, I'll continue to live. I believe, brother, I believe, sister, if I drink this water, I'll go on living. I believe. And you can stand right there next to that cart of food and die of starvation. But I believed it, Pastor Tim. Yeah, you're, you're halfway there. Yeah, you, you, I'm glad you believe that food will sustain you. I, I, I'm glad you believe water will quench your thirst. It starts there. But if you don't receive the food, If you don't receive the drink, your thirst will never be quenched. I don't care how much you believe in the water. See, the Bible says there will be many on that day that say, Lord, Lord, we believed. And they'll be turned away. Oh, I see, that's what a lot of these world religions say. Oh, I believe in God. Great. You're halfway there, see. Believe. But you got to what? Receive. To appropriate the gift. To appropriate the benefit of that belief. When we get done today, we're going home. Bless my heart. We got some food to eat. And I believe. And I got a big belly. It's getting back. I got I to gotta do something with this thing. I know. But I believe it's going to what? It's going to fill me up. Oh, I believe it. See, I'm here. I believe it. But when I get home, I can't just sit around the table and look at all that food and say, oh, I believe. I got to do what? What do you got to do? You got to receive it. We got to receive the food. We got to receive the drink. We have to receive Jesus Christ into our hearts and lives to what? To be saved from our sins. To be healed, to be delivered, to be comforted. Whatever it is, we have to receive Receive Jesus. The third thing we must do is that we then what? Confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, if you confess, if is a conditional clause, right? If. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart, here it is, Paul's breaking it down for us. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. In other words, we believe the food is going to satisfy the hunger. We believe the drink is going to quench the thirst. Amen. We receive the food, we receive the drink, and then we confess, yep, it did. I'm no longer hungry. I'm no longer thirsty. The food did what I believed it would do. The drink did what I believed it would do. And I confess it's true. See, that's the thing. So when we believe, when we receive, then we what? Then we give confession. In other words, for confession would be testimony. Testimony. And oh, by the way, this is the same way you get healed. This is the same way you get delivered. This is the same way you get set free. It's the same equation. It, it, it's, it's no harder to get healed than it is to get saved. It's, same, it's the same faith. You believe God can heal you. You believe God can save you. You believe God can comfort you. You believe God can set you free from drug addiction. Wonderful. But then you have to receive Jesus, right? 
And then you what? All of a sudden, I'm saved. I'm healed. I'm delivered. I'm set free. And it, and it manifests in your heart and in your life. So I have one concluding question for you today. And that is this. What will you do, my friends, with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus today? 1 John 5 says this. God has given us eternal life. This life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. What will you do with Jesus today? 2,000 years ago, this weekend, Jesus Christ died a horrific, horrible, painful death for your sins and for my sins. Three days later, the judge of heaven and earth, God Almighty, sat on his judicial throne and accepted that payment. Demonstrated and showed the acceptance of that payment by resurrecting Jesus from the dead. What will you do with Jesus? Will you believe him today? Will you receive Him today? Will you confess Him today as your personal Lord and Savior? Will you trust Him to save you from your sins and to reconcile and restore your life to where you can experience His love, His purpose, and His plan for your life? That's why Jesus came and died some 2,000 years ago. That's why the Father sent Jesus for you and I to believe, to receive, and to confess Him as our personal Lord and Savior. You know, here's the wonderful thing about our God is He would have sent Jesus to die for you if you were the only sinner on planet earth. That's how much he loves you. That's how much he loves me. If we were the only ones, he loves us so much. He says, I've, I've got to restore that relationship with them. I got to reconcile my relationship with them because I love them so much. And God rolled the dice because there was no guarantee that any of us were going to accept him. That's the, that's the amazing thing about love. When you give your heart to someone else, some of you know what I'm talking about because you had your heart broken by somebody else. There's no guarantee they're going to love you back. And God bankrupted heaven. He didn't have a thousand sons. He had one son. Sent him to earth and rolled the dice and said, we're going we're gonna to tell them we love them. We're going to show them we love them. And you're going to die for their sins. And Jesus, I'm going to resurrect you three days later to make it possible for them to appropriate salvation into their hearts and lives. But here's the reality, my friends. It's up to you and it's up to me to choose to receive that gift. God will not force salvation. God will not force Jesus on any of us. It's a gift. And God's saying, I love you so much. Here's the gift. And the gift is forgiveness. The gift is pardon. The gift is salvation and healing and deliverance. The gift is peace and joy, unspeakable and full of glory. What must I do, Pastor Tim? Help me. Ask for it. Ask to receive Jesus into your heart and life. Would you do that with me today? Maybe there's just one person here. Maybe there's just one person watching us live right now on our tab telecast. And you'd say, Pastor Tim, I want to receive Jesus into my heart and life. I want to be reconciled in my relationship with God, my Father. I want to experience that everlasting, unconditional, unfathomable love. Would you lead me in a prayer? Yes, I would, my friend. 
Let's pray. Would you bow your heads with me today? And I want you, for those of you that want to receive Jesus into your heart and life, I want you to pray this prayer, not to me or anyone here. I want you to say these words to God and meet Him with every fiber of your being. And by saying these words, by praying this prayer, you are saying, Pastor Tim, I believe, I receive, and I desire to become a son of God, a daughter of God. If that's you today, would you pray this prayer out loud? And my friends that have already prayed that prayer are also going to pray that prayer out loud with you. You're not alone. Say these words. Dear God, I come before you this morning, a sinner in need of your grace. Forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart and life and be my Lord and Savior. And help me live for you all the days of my life and help me be a witness for you to others all the days of my life until you call me home to be with you in heaven. This I ask and pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So be it. Hallelujah. All right, put your hands together, would you? <laughs> Hallelujah.